I'm happy today to start in the introduction of our three poets with poet Leah Martel. Leah comes originally from Bulgaria. She had been involved with some theater there as a child and immigrated over to the United States later on, where she went into the study of writing and literature, <coughs> intending to make a career in that area, but along the way became involved in the world of numbers and is presently working as a biostatistician, which she admits is a showstopper and a mouthful to say <laughs> at parties. <laughs> And uh, in her spare time, uh, she keeps going back to the writing of her poetry. And when I asked Leah what she thought about life that inspires her, she said, I am fascinated with the way people are, the mysterious interplay between what we see ourselves like, how others perceive us, and the odd drive for rationality when the process of being appears so ultimately intricate. And here to share some of her poetry with us today. Please help me welcome Leah Martel. It's called Hope. <clears throat> On a late summer afternoon, the wind picks up and steadies its direction. The waves, yielding to a faster beat, start towering over the sandbar. I watch transfixed, my eyes caressed by the swelling rise of each approaching body of light and water. The surface smooth and uninterrupted runs and curves to orchestrate a roaring clash to introduce the deeper bass of an impending resolution. The foam rolled back and forth, floats up the moment's hush. A choreography of motion that seemingly repeats itself yet never forms quite the same. The surf unfolds, the edge extends, another rush, a sudden pause. The cycle carried on as if God himself is sitting on the bank, inspired to produce its very best in term terms of dance and interplay forces. The conflict brought on by the search and withdrawal secretes unease into my bloodstream. My heart quickens and the reasons, though present, remain obscured to our words and thought. What if there is more to me than just the impetus from birth to death? Taking the vast ocean, I lay my gaze on the horizon. It defies, I think, the infinite, like in no end, timeless, without limits. It also sets the single boundary no one can breach. The idea of something beyond, a spirit that can span the stretch between a perishable body and its immortal soul, should it exist, is rather tempting. The promise to, for eternity confined into a shell of flesh. Waves swash in darker, ch darker channels, roll driven by incessant drum, in notion similar to the control exerted over the breathing mass of the ocean. But when it comes to the fall, when the time arrives, the frame succumbs irreversibly to gravity, the ghost escapes intact. A miracle like this warrants action. Can't I break the ties with fearful self, dismiss thirst, hunger, pain caused by the strain to be, and look for comfort in the subtle signs people claim are evidence of the divine? The magnitude of the idea makes me tired. I close my eyes and search for solace. I sense the flawless synchrony of life being carried out below. The warmth of my skin, the pulse in my veins, the composition of cells working together like parts of a symphonic orchestra. The violins, bows, and strings launch on when, when the trumpets leave off for the sip of air. The heart as symbol strikes the start of a new harmony. The rhythm appears familiar, my mother's womb, a lullaby, a lover's breath. In the dark, I'm vulnerable and naked. Under the roar of, roar of the surf, I want to hear your voice. The brush of the constant wind makes me dream for the touch of your fingers. The desire for shelter, protection grows. Not imaginary, not drop on my knees and pray half fearful, half hopeful that whoever pulls the strings of my, of my fate will be merciful enough to help, but rather I miss the certainty of your arms. The cosmological problems fade when I unfulfilled yearning place analogy for your taken away but promised love. Thank you very much. Kate grew up in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, and some of her best memories in growing up uh, were the time spent. Uh, in the cottage that her grandparents owned on the uh, coast in New Hampshire. And many of her poems have been inspired by that 
as well as other family moments and observations. Um, Kate wrote her first poem uh, as a child, and uh, I think uh, she said it was in elementary school, and it was some gooey, slurpy, rhymy poem. <laughs> But she kept on writing. She had the bug. Being a voracious reader as well, she loved the reading and the writing of poetry and went on to study English and literature in college and beyond and at the same time was also working as a waitress and believes that everyone should have that as part of their education, that she learned so much at working at IHOP and she met her husband there. And since then, Kate has um, been working as a tutor, as a professor, as an editor, a freelance writer, and also spending her time writing poetry. And here she is today to share her observations of the world as she see it, the people in it, um, and all of the different ways that it goes. Please help me welcome today poet Kate Connors. This first one is called Reverence, um, and it's for my grandfather, who's no longer here. The aura of solemnity would waft from the quiet bedroom. I could feel it as I tipped down, tiptoed down the hallway, trying to be invisible like the Holy Spirit, the part of God I liked best. Papa knelt on the hard floor, elbows resting on the four-poster bed, whose soft embrace had held him and my grandmother for decades. In his hands, a whole array of saints, prayers for every occasion and time, novenas for whatever ached the soul or worried the mind, flowery cards, wooden beads, objects handed down through generations, the household tools of devotion. Something in his posture said more to me about humility than all those lessons on proper church behavior ever did. Here was reverence, pure and private, and my young eyes drank it in, enveloped in the spirit of quiet awe that put this tall and stately man on his knees. There are days now when I understand how comforting that kneeling was the discomfort of the body endured to find the peace of the soul. There are days when, like him, I could kneel in place for hours, never lacking things to pray for, and never knowing who might be peeking in, feeling the presence of something that beckons, silence, peace, mystery. And this one's for my grandmother who passed away last October at 102. I'm psyched to have her genes. <laughs> um, one of the things I'm sure many people notice is the ways in which you start turning into your, your ancestors. <laughs> and for me, it's in the hands. Uh, my mother's hands look like my grandmother's hands, and my hands look like my mother's hands. And I'm hoping my poor daughter doesn't get them. But um, after visiting her, I. I kept thinking about her hands and my hands. Her tiny, gnarled hands surprise with warmth emanating from the hollow of her twisted grip. Fingers that look like driftwood, bones curved impossibly, painfully changed from the hands that once held a needle so surely to mend the rips our family made or press pie dough expertly into comfort for us all. Now desiccated nails, impossibly bright with varnish, the work of some devoted granddaughter or one of the women who knows my grandmother's days now better than I do. She holds onto my hand, my fingers a memory of what hers looked like once, and she does not let go. Our fingers stay entwined all the while we are talking, watery blue eyes smiling, gripping familiar warmth, yesterday and tomorrow swirling like lines on driftwood, like bones twisting to grasp something more.
moving forward from grandparents to children. Um, my husband Jack and I are the parents of children who are getting ready to go, uh, one in college, one toward the end of high school, and one beginning high school. And um, this may resonate with those of you who are parents at that stage or have been. Empty house. My children are like ghosts some days, vague presences who drift through the kitchen, then disappear to a world they inhabit without me. They leave evidence of their existence, discarded books, shirts scented with their aromas, a tangy mixture of deodorant mixed with sweat on the boys' gray shirts, sweet florals lingering on the sweaters of my daughter, but even these objects point more to their absence than their presence here, haunting the house like the photos of the dead. I wander through the mess, replacing books on shelves, trying to determine which gray items to wash, setting things back in place. I tell myself it is for them, so they will have order to come home to, but I think it is for me, rearranging the scenery so I am not so pained by the way their belongings tell me they are leaving me. I pick up ca college catalogs that look like travel posters, scribbled notes fallen from backpacks, names of people I don't know, cryptic lines that hint at jokes and plans I may or may not ever know about. I erase their mess while they are gone, so they will come back to me and fill the emptiness again with all those mysterious tokens of their growing up. The house is ready now, like a stage set and waiting for the lights to come up. I hope I remember my lines. This one's for my 14-year-old daughter. Braiding. <clears throat> like a handmaiden in some ancient tale, I sit behind my young lady, twisting and taming the wild strands of hair. From the chaos of waves, I weave a cord strong as rope. The wizardry complete, she assesses her reflection, and pleased for the moment, she thanks me, as if it were I who did her a favor, not knowing I would sit for hours twisting and untwisting, coiling and unwinding the mysterious connection that binds us. Now the dark. <laughs> um, this is for a friend who lost a child. Discord. We kneel in the grass, folded like prayerful children, bent, bereft, bewildered. We stare into the shiny black granite as if from its depths some sign will emanate and give us comfort. We wait while tears fall and a hawk flies overhead. Dragonflies whir and land on flowers, gauzed winged messengers from some place we cannot visit. She calls his name. It echoes in the sunshine like an incongruous note amidst the harmony of flowers. Waiting room. You can't tell by looking. It's only the robe that distinguishes who's who, since the guarded expression is written in everyone's eyes. The volunteer with soft brown eyes offers me coffee, but I'm not sure if I'm allowed to have it, as if there's an, a finite amount of compassion and I might be using up someone's share. Old men are chatting across the aisle. One says he's from Maine. The other sounds like a Texan. They seem equally surprised to be here sipping cranberry juice at the Oncology Center in Boston. My friend steps into the little cubicle, emerges looking thin and chilly in her robe. Her name is called and she follows obediently, resigned to this daily ritual. In those 10 minutes, I sit quietly hearing the snippets of everyone's stories, everyone different, everyone similar. It's the ordinariness of the place that bothers me, as bland as a dentist office or the division of motor vehicles. Maybe I thought it would seem more dramatic, colorful, urgent. My friend has cancer, 
Cancer, don't you see? I want to yell at no one in particular. I don't yell at anyone. On the way home, we stop for hot, dark coffee at a cozy local spot. We breathe in the aroma of an ordinary morning and say nothing about tomorrow. Yep. Yes. Magic soup. Somewhere in this dim winter afternoon, you are resting. Maybe today you are downstairs, having tired of the view of your bedroom. Maybe you are looking out at the snow in your yard and wondering about spring, imagining colors that are not yet here. I am outside, quietly leaving ineffectual soup and words in bright ink, as if it were only a cold and a bad day we are fighting. I have stirred into a broth all the worry and love I can pour out, wishing its salty warmth could penetrate what chills you. If I could make them do as I wish, carrots with their orange cheer would lift you, and noodles would make you plump up with strength. Broccoli would wave its calcium into your bones while steaming broth and spices brought you back to yourself. If only soup were magic, as in a children's fable, it would be my potion, and you would be the miracle. The next two are in honor of girlfriends. Coming back in the light. In silence. In silence, warm hands gently cradling mine, you gave me quiet and the gift of stopping. The stillness refreshed me like a nap in gray afternoon or the first sip of tea after a winter walk. No one looking at us could know whether our hearts overflowed with sadness or joy. Profound in silence was the mystery of our heart prayers. Two women at a kitchen table who knows what power resides in that sacred, ordinary space? She doesn't believe in angels, but wouldn't mind being one. The wings might be cumbersome, but the satisfaction would be worth it. She gets a kick out of serendipity, solving problems, surprising strangers with help. She hates anonymity, loves connection, and often, often startles strangers with advice. She brews tea by the hour, pouring its warmth like tonic for the world. And in all her 80 years, magnanimity has ruled. She has rarely been shunned, refused, or ignored, which convinces her the world is hungry, starving, in fact, and might just need the bread of angels after all. Spring tulips. What luck it is to be stopped in traffic, just at this curve in this old road, where audacious red and yellow tulips are heralding spring. Like garish young girls, these vibrant, irreverent blooms toss themselves in the breeze next to ancient gravestones scattered and tilting in the frozen dirt. Carriages once brought the village dead to lie on the other side of that stone wall beneath cold earth. Now, stopped in my modern travels, I remember for a moment that I belong to both the blossom and the stone. And this one's for Jack. Odds. No one would believe the kind of Vegas-like odds I live by. For what are the chances, really, that one would wake up rubbing one's foot along the arch of another's, knowing that in the haze of groggy morning, the owner of that foot will return the rub and raise it by a corny joke, deal me a stroke from a warm, affectionate hand, spin the room with the brush of soft, familiar lips, and leave me reeling like a lucky winner 
blinking in disbelief as I see the shower of riches tumbling, pouring out improbably for me. Thank you. Diane was here as a feature last year, but she was here to talk about other poets that she has interviewed in her book chat project about spirituality and poetry. And uh, she had interviewed a number of nationally known poets and uh, shared her information about that then. Today she's here to share some of her own writing. Diane comes from Stafford Springs, Connecticut, where she was born. And she enjoyed spending her childhood. Uh, one of the things she uh, recalls is being on the swings with her sister and making up songs together then. And she wrote her first poem also in elementary school. And uh, she noted that she turned it into her teacher, who made a big deal and put it on the bulletin board. And she felt it was like winning an Oscar. <laughs> And then she added, because she got needs improvement comments on her penmanship and her music rates. <laughs> she went on to study English and writing. And Diane has worked in many different types of jobs involving the literary. She's been an editor. She has been a uh, co-founder of different literary organizations associated with Yale is one. She is editor of the poetry, uh, Peregrine uh, Poetry Magazine now. And uh, she also uh, is an editor for people working on their books and novels. And she writes her own stuff to her poetry and her short stories and her prose. When asked um, about uh, what inspires her to write uh, and um, what is it about life that inspires you to write, Diane noted, sometimes it's just a way to work something out or explore some emotional turmoil and put it into words. I seem to write in the form of poetry when I have something I need to hide, and I write in prose when I have something I want to share. So let's see what she has in store for us this morning. Please help me welcome Diane Biliak. OK, so I'm going to start with a story. And uh, I've been writing these stories about my sister. And I say the first line says she has Down syndrome. But I'm trying to work it out into some sort of play monologue thing. And I don't know. I really don't know what I'm doing. But I do like writing the stories. And I'm going to share this first one with you. It's called Damn Yogurt. My only sister, Christine, is 44 and has a condition called Down syndrome. We're Irish twins born less than a year apart. For four days each May, we are the same age. She currently lives in a supervised apartment where she considers herself to be a staff person there and not one of the clients that she calls her housemates. Over the years, I've heard many derogatory terms attributed to her condition, and sometimes, based on her behavior, I add my own and refer to her as both a liar and a thief. Considering her intellectual capabilities, she is a virtuoso in these disciplines. She assumes that she can outwit people simply through repeated and persistent denial. But since later she often processes every thought out loud, I can usually acquire the truth if I hide nearby and listen. For example, one time she was confessing, yeah, so what if I took Uncle's cell phone? It's mine now. <laughs> So I yelled out, I heard that, and she answered, what? I didn't say anything. Then added, besides, I wasn't talking to you. <laughs> Her life of pilfering began early with the persistent acquisition of pens. Chris carries around a plastic bag of them wherever she goes. If I dare ask to use one, she'll peer into the bag and jiggle it around to find the perfect pen which means the crappiest one that also works. <laughs> As I start to use it, she stands near me like a hornet hovering over a morsel of food and repeats in her monotone voice, are you done with it yet? Are you done with it yet? Are you done with it yet? Once I lost my patience and said, 
Does it look like I'm done? I haven't even written a full sentence yet. Besides, you probably took this from me back in high school, so I might never return it. This caused her to release an audible gasp, followed by a few whispered swears. But moments later, when I gave her the pen, she said, thanks, darling. It's about time. <laughs> Besides pocketing pens, she's often in trouble at her many work placements because she works around food. For people to think that she's qualified for the food industry just because she loves to eat has not been the best tactic. <laughs> at one job, she was spoken to for her habit of stopping by the bakery and leisurely grabbing a coffee or some random baked goods out of the case. It seems that the ladies who worked there would occasionally indulge her. And my sister wouldn't quite get that when Dottie or Gloria were not working that day, the muffins were not free. When I got wind of this, I sat with her and tried to instruct her not to take these items. Using good old-fashioned guilt mixed with intimidation, I'd say, repeat after me. You can't just take the muffins. I like the muffins. I'd say, but that's stealing. You have to pay for them. I've got money, she'd answer and then add, besides, you're not the boss of me. I'm older than you. <laughs> With exasperation, I'd say, not even by a year. Just say you won't take the muffins. It was a verbal shakedown, and she broke me as usual. She can be both good cop and alleged criminal, so sly in her apparent innocence, but also a relentless and shrewd evader of questions. <clears throat> Finally, I just kept repeating, are you going to take the muffins? But the answer was never no. Just a series of yeses and one or two maybes that in their honesty made us laugh. And I knew in my heart that those baked goods didn't stand a chance of staying in their cases. But my favorite Christine work story involved a six ounce container of yogurt. About a month after the muffin incident, she'd moved on to the dairy case. She took a yogurt and went straight to the break room. In mid-swallow, the manager came in and she was busted. He threw away the evidence, and she was promptly let go. I imagine that Chris was more upset that they didn't let her finish that yogurt than she was about being fired. <laughs> For a while afterwards, she would walk around the house and raise her fist to the sky. We'd hear her slowly mutter these two simple but poignant words. Damn yogurt. <laughs> It was as if, in her mind, she felt it was the yogurt's fault. It was as if to say, you nasty yogurt, you dairy case temptress, you have ruined me for the last time. Since then, she doesn't work as much, and when she does, most of the jobs involve cleaning. Thankfully, it's not at a bank or another office setting, because the constant availability of pens would lure her back into a life of petty crime. As a professional student and a part-time writer, I really shouldn't point my finger at her. I didn't compile a resume until I was 30 and haven't had a full-time job since I worked one summer at the DMV in 1984. <laughs> Plus, I'm not innocent. I've taken my share of file folders and pens and duplicated personal documents using the office copy machine. The difference is that I know how to lie and steal and get away with it. <laughs> In truth, I suppose neither of us are meant for the working world. Christine and I are a bit more freewheeling and creative. We're the morale boosters, the coworker most likely to sneak off for a snack. For that reason, I propose that establishments resurrect the medieval practice of having a court jester. Therefore, instead of being frustrated or penalized at work, we could legitimately be paid for the comic relief we now provide for free. Just before Chris was relieved of her duties at the damn yogurt store, our cousin Dee Dee observed her with her work buddies gathering carts outside. About five or six of her peers surrounded her, and she was telling some story with her distinct flair. In a flourish to signify the end, she suddenly raised her hands and gave everyone a complimentary high five. As they basked in the wake of her untamed joy, she slyly waltzed away, leaving her grinning co-workers behind to collect the rest of the carts. <laughs> Entering through the whoosh of the automatic doors, she mused to herself and out loud at the same time, my work here is done. <laughs> so that's my sister, and uh, she gives me a lot of material. <laughs> um, so the next three are, are some short poems, and I have five minutes, okay. 
It's going to be like five minutes and 13 seconds, I think. <laughs> um, but these three are sort of about different shades of love. And I actually stole this from an email my friend Laura sent me a long time ago. And, um, and so she's in Germany, so she can't do anything about it. <laughs> um, it's called Reading Comprehension Test. At the lighthouse this morning, there was a long line out the door practically. And I saw Lewis at the counter. He leaned over, looked in my direction, then smiled and waved. I smiled and waved back, and then noticed two other people in front of me waving at him as well. You see, everybody loves Lewis, and they thought he was waving at them. I got my coffee and went around the counter to put sugar in it, but the sugar wasn't there, so I had to go around the far side to get it. Then, for no apparent reason, Lewis came over and stood directly across from where I was. I could have reached over the counter and grabbed him. But I couldn't say anything, and he was sort of doing something, and he didn't say anything either, which is probably for the best since I have a boyfriend. What I ended up doing was pouring a ton of sugar in my coffee. Anyway, I finally had to leave, and I turned to say goodbye to Lewis, but then Frank started talking to me, and I wasn't able to stop him. From the above selection, the reader can conclude that A, the lighthouse is a cafe, B, Lewis was waving at the speaker. C, the speaker's love for love life revolves around sugar. Or D, who the hell is Frank? <laughs> um, so this, this next one is called, it's like a pre-breakup poem. And it's called Passive Aggressive, A Love Story. <laughs> We mutually agree after the first time we say, I love you, that we'll never say it again, and let it be like a flag that starts a race. So after a while, you say it by leaving hair in the tub, or by tracking mud onto the new Berber carpet. And you say it when you ruin my grandmother's antique table by spilling the hot tea I bought you, brought you when you were sick. But really, I didn't mind, because I knew that it was your special way of saying it. Sometimes now we look for each other like I've seen you search for something in the fridge. Maybe it's simply behind the milk or the leftovers, but you'll stare at the lined up food as if it's a chess game in progress, where a move in any direction might break the spell of trying to find it. Or maybe it's on the counter, but you won't look on the counter because your mother always kept the butter in the icebox. That's what you call it, icebox, like it's the 1920s, as if, Steer, as if Sears still had a Roebuck attached to it. But at my house, we called it a fridge and kept the butter on the counter, where I've told you to look a million times. And finally, when you don't see what you want, you slam the fridge door, and that really says it. Then you stand at the counter, the butter dish only inches away, eating your dry toast in silence. <laughs> Do I have a little bit more for one? OK. Uh, and then the last one is, is the breakup poem. Um, and these are really more like prose poems. Um, and it's called Singing in the Car. Here we go toward that town where she worries she might see him. I can tell it's going to be a bad day because she just programmed that song so it's on repeat, so she can listen to it again and again. That means she's going to keep singing it, and it's going to be loud. She might even hit my dash or some other part of me for emphasis. I don't have a great vocabulary for feelings. In fact, I don't really have feelings or a great vocabulary at all. <laughs> but I wish I could tell her that it's not good to downshift like that, that the rear view mirror is for looking back when you want to change lanes, not for looking back and back and back. <laughs> I want to tell her these things. I want to tell her that it will get better and that I'll take her wherever she wants to go. But I'm just her car. And damn it, I feel so helpless. <laughs> Thank you very much. Music is always a part of our program here. And today, I'm happy and honored to introduce music duo Lori Diamond and Fred Abatelli. Lori was born in Melrose and Fred in New York City. And now Lori comes from Northborough and Fred from Nashua, New Hampshire. They met each other, although they were performing independently before in different kinds of bands. They met up in 2007 on MySpace. 
and from that point on, they have been performing out as a duo, and they've been sharing their background experience of music in jazz and folk and pop and blues and putting it all together, doing cover songs, but also now um, composing songs together. Uh, as a duo. At first, Lori was uh, writing the songs, and then Fred joined in, and they now put them together. And sometimes they find weird things uh, of the synergy of their uh, duo partnership where they think of the same melody and notes at the same time. I, I understand. So, so there's some great magic happening with the music that they have been coming up with and performing. And when asked, um, one of the best moments for uh, sharing their songs and good things that have resulted from sharing their music out in the world, they replied, I think the best part about sharing our songs in the world is that we stay true to ourselves and do what we love, and a lot of folks thankfully like it. It's a great feeling to be able to be creative and not be confined by parameters. We just follow our bliss and somehow the rest follows. So we look forward to hearing them follow their bliss with us this morning. Please help me welcome Lori Diamond and Fred Abitelli. This first song is called Cherry Hill, not about Cherry Hill, New Jersey, although I'm sure it's very lovely. Uh, this song is more about es escaping everyday life. Cherry Hill.
next song it's called the inside sounds a little dark but there is hope hang on it's early Sunday morning he goes out for a drive he finds himself passing the home that he once knew, the house they built together way back when he was on the inside. The snow is falling. She left it willingly 
that they will never go back to where they used to be. Well, they won't leave so willingly. They wonder how can they find a way to make this new decision to be living on the inside. Thank you so much. This next song is the title track to our CD, our latest CD, which is available in the back room. This song is called Mystery, and it's an invitation to fall in love, even with a wounded heart.
better believe it when I hold you and I love you and there'll be no mystery it's Fred Apatelli thank you Lori one more so we're going to end this on a light note because that always feels good. It's a brand new song. It's called The Perfect Moment.
much. It's Fred Abatelli and Laurie Diamond. Tune in to the journey. Tune in to life. Change the channels if need be. When we cram the past, present, and future into the moment, we make living something else. None of us owns a crystal ball or the blueprints for each journey. Life is little by little, not all at once. Tune in to the dream. Imagination is the cutting edge of curiosity. Explorations are what makes us dreamers. A dream becomes the self unwrapped, revealing potential and possibility. Tune in to the playtime. Laughter, do not go anywhere without it. It is an invitation to hoot, flash a Cheshire cat grin, hold the stomach, wipe away tears, and whoops, pee in the pants. Those who smile are not worried about wrinkles. Comedy opens the drain of a clogged heart and mind. Tune in to the becoming. Humans being, the be in being is not lost unless we have already forgotten. Insomnia happens when we forget to pause and rest our soul. Tune in to the celebrations. Optimus sees the timeless opportunities to make the first footprints whoop it up at any age. Never say never, inspire a new genius. Tune in to the rejuvenation. Serenity answers when we stop changing, chasing life. Meditation is the moment of stillness. Dance with or without a partner. Become the lyrics. Dance wild. Dance quiet. An epiphany is it a welcome aha. Tune in to the new dawn. The paradox of losing oneself to find oneself is hope unveiled. Tune in to Mother Earth. Risk, even nature risks saying spring too soon. Like circadian rhythms of the ocean tide, let life's ebb and flow cleanse the soul. An eagle soars above the odds. Why not you? Thank you. This is called Memoirs of a Fire-Eating Mother. <laughs> they are so young. We want to save them from the fiery parts of learning the burns and blisters they'll inevitably raise on their hands, on their tongues, the scar tissue they'll grow to protect their vulnerable fingertips. We see their hearts burning over bright, glowing through their bones and scorching their skin with that searing white light. It takes practice, we tell them, not to swallow the fire whole, to switch the flame quickly from the tongue to the torch, feeling the warmth rather than the dangerous sizzle of a burning flare. We remind them to fuel with less volatile combustibles, 
paraffin rather than gas, glue rather than alcohol. We could tell them, just avoid the whole business. Let the heart smolder, burn out, spiral down to an unobtrusive heap of indifferent ash. But that's not truly an option. If we are to breathe or to fly, to avert a cold death of antipathy. We wouldn't compel them to fly with clipped wings or sing with a muzzled snout or walk with knuckled feet. So we struggle to coach them, train them to eat fire benignly, carefully and with aplomb, so they will ingest its heat and savor its warmth rather than spit it all out in pain with a blistering tongue inured to taste. We teach them to savor the bits of wisdom embedded in their scorch marks and scar tissue, to bite elegantly and swallow discriminately, <coughs> to comfortably digest the grace of passion. We hope they'll continue to attend their flaming banquets, abounding with the many flavors of fire, hot and yellow, orange and crackling, blue and smoldering, nourishing one another as they learn this ancient art of eating fire and how we usually burn only those we truly love. Thank you. It's called McMansions. The McMansions are going up everywhere, just like the big hotels slap down on a Monopoly game, and they too are plastic. People played Monopoly during the Depression, pretend money replacing the real thing because there was none. Plastic vinyl houses are replacing those made of wood and stone and brick. It's all pretend material because there is none. Pretend wood made of vinyl, pretend window panes made of vinyl, and a white picket fence to surround it all, vinyl. Juggling plastic credit card debt to pay for the plastic house, to pay for the things to put into the plastic house, the plastic economy is an illusion of substance. Beware of what it is replacing. And my next poem is called The Idiot Box. <laughs> the box sits in the living room, giving black reflection to the room if not turned on. Always it reflects back like a mirror. When turned on, the light shadows pretend it life. And some people forget that it, it is shadow play. It has many voices and channels and shows and commercials and soundtracks and personalities. They all give the box a life of its very own. Most families turn it off to go to bed, but their dreaming continues it on, and a hunger for more and more soon devours everything. This is called Once Upon a Time. i 
remembering you Once upon a time This is a little thing called uh, beer for breakfast. Faded songs. He used to dream he had a girl back home with a flower pressed between pages in a book of poems kept for him waiting for his return. Huh. One semester I found an enormous flattened dead cockroach under the cover of a library book with browned pages close to disintegration. His father died and they told him he was too young to go home. He couldn't be of any use to his mother. 
even though he was the oldest in a large family. So they made him a lance corporal, a squad leader for men close to his age, 18. We stand facing the wall, his trembling fragmentation palpable as he says, I need to sit down. I bring him hot cocoa and a hot dog, all they have at the stand. He remembers being in the bush all the time. He remembers being frightened. He remembers the responsibility for the lives of his men, and he knows some of their names are there on the wall. During taps, we glance sideways to the statue. Three soldiers sharing arms and one shouldering his M60 and ammo sleeves. In the ensuing silence, I wonder aloud, what might they be thinking? And he tells me, they're thinking I hope I make it home. At twilight, I make a rubbing of the name of a football star extinguished too soon after high school graduation ceremony. He developed survival skills while exploring a rainforest tainted with orange and with sounds reverberating from bombs bursting in air and on the ground. Huh, one fourth of July, a rocket launcher tipped over and shot straight at me across a pond exploding against the embankment, shooting and spraying flaming bits as my buckled knees dropped my open mouth to the ground. Staring nowhere with his nightmare diagnosis of PTSD, he returned home having lost the ability to hear, mermaids calling and psalmists singing. Like an incarnate Statue of Liberty, I stand holding an unopened book while trying to lighten the cavernous lack of a welcome home.
This is a poem called Stories of Undoing. She only told stories of undoing, each story a dark cloud of woe. Her stories swam in darkness, through despair to danger. Her stories were wrapped in sadness, each one whispering, too bad, too bad, too bad. Each story traveled from injustice to injustice, picking every scab. She only told stories the same as we all tell stories. She just wanted someone to listen to her. She found in every pot the crack, real or imagined. She yearned for someone to let her in. At arm's length, I kept her. Her stories sucked the joy right out of the air. Her stories blotted out the sun. Her stories were her undoing. So here we go. It's called uh, Ricky the Kid. Well, the sun sets upon the hill On brick mansions by the sea Surrounded by a playground of hell Oh, my country, tears of thee Well, we drank dreams from a paper bag And Jack Frost paints the sky in drag Blood and gold and red on a deep blue sea Skies of majesty. Ricky the kid, well, he ain't no more. He's a casualty of the social war. And some say ran his life to hell. Oh, well, me, I said he slipped and fell. time and now he's hanging with some friends of mine washed up on God's golden shore in a pool of blood from the jewelry store he's a mercy for me well I know it's hard to understand Disciplined man who's never known the sleight of hand and taught never to trust. Will the kids play in the dark and bullets fly across the park? Children playing life like war.
Um, this is called Next to Nothing. I stand on sand. Sand touches water. The waters reach to touch the sky that arches up and over, reaching down to touch the land where I trace this strand of sand before me to left the land to right the sea. Dry sand is soft, wet sand is firm. Beneath the waves, eternity. Then I look back toward the wasteland at all the sad, sad things I've done, at all the love that I have squandered, at all the races I have run. Now I turn towards a rising sun, a prodigal, the restless one. The time has come to take these burdens, to leave them here upon the sand. To walk this shore unencumbered, to face the dawn as I am. Here is sand, there is water, solid land, liquid sea. And the sky is next to nothing, and next to nothing is next to me. Thank you. The name of this poem is called Taking It In. <clears throat> Sitting quietly, attentive to life, watching, listening, taking it in. The sky, air so blue, the trees, gentle rustling, watching, listening, taking it in, moment to moment, life in the present, watching, listening, taking it in. Thank you. Suburban life left it all behind.